Okay, so that floor button's off, the grid's off. Now I can come up here, and let's take a look at this see-through. There's been a couple of times this has not worked in a go-to webinar. So if it doesn't, just do this, and you, you'll, you'll see real quick. It's real simple slider. Voila. Okay, now I'm going to set my see-through at 51. As long as I am in this canvas area, it's going to be see-through. As soon as I go into interface, you'll see it no longer is transparent. Interface, canvas. Interface, canvas. Let's close that. I can navigate. That was a little interface item. Start to carve in, start to build up, give those cheeks a real nice form. and start checking your your volume okay this is this see-through is really the evolution see-through is really was that breakthrough in their minds in the developers minds where it's like okay now we've got it I would use transparency like this to just kind of check something and then or move it off to the side and you can adjust your see-through so it's not so much and you're just checking reference, you're checking lines. Where's that infraorbital margin go? Where's your uh, nasal labial fold go? You're just kind of basically lining these elements up. Bottom of the nose, boom, boom, boom. This is quite useful and very powerful. And so I'll have Pinterest on in the background uh, of some image or a couple of things I'm working on and uh, this will work really, really well. Any questions about that? Yeah, some people will use, let's turn see-through off. Some people will just use uh, Alt-Tab and you go back and forth like an animator with a flip book some reason it's a little slow but this is kind of that next level or if you're an animator animators do this too they have that onion skinning it's really cool you can make it a hundred percent and then not hundred percent and not all right let me just stop there for a second so you gather your thoughts. If anybody's typing a question to me, this is a great moment. Because now we've covered uh, reference images in the most basic way. There's a lot of other ways. Spotlight, um, there is this light background texture that you can do. That's pretty neat. There's also document and ZApp link properties. You're welcome to explore those. I don't want to get into them right now because they are more complicated. Uh, so Z-Appling Properties is one of the ones that I was working on with the programmer, uh, Annalise, and uh, we were. this was one of our contributions. And uh, the Make Character Sheet, if it's working, sometimes it works, sometimes it gets turned off because it doesn't connect with the API. It's pretty cool. Uh, but this is not nearly as simple as see-through and it's not nearly as robust as using a grid. Uh, and Charles is asking about uh, when the see-through feature came about and I'm pretty sure it's the most recent. And uh, 
Steve is asking, can you make a hot key or a macro for see-through? Uh, and I can address that real briefly, although macros I want to get into a little later. But macros are these, uh, they're these, how do I say it? Uh, if you use Photoshop, they're like droplets or actions. So you come with these macros, these pre-built ones. I've got a macro right here that's 1280. Uh, by 720 and what that does is it goes into my interface it sets my document to 1280 by 720 and then redraws the model on the screen I'll show you that right now but before I do just so you know exactly what I'm doing notice that my document is kind of shrunk and that's because anytime you bring in a new project this document size is treated as a throwaway and it's optimized for the amount of display space you have. So for example, if I come into Lightbox and I bring in a default sphere, now suddenly the canvas is all the way out to the sides. Let me open up the tray. I'm going to go to Lightbox, default sphere. Then I'm going to close the tray. Now I've got extra space. So this is again because it's optimizing the canvas size according to the available pixels. And it's important because what you don't know about this canvas is that it's actually a 3D space containing what they call pixels. And each one of those pixels contains a lot of information and so it can you know really slow your computer down if you have a lot of uh, if you have a really large amount of pixels we'll get to that a little bit later but let me show you this macro I'm gonna go in it's 1280 by 720 it just did a bunch of things it grew the document and then it redrew and put what I was working on in edit mode and it did that all by me recording a new macro. Let's say new macro and then just clicking through the steps of what I wanted it to do. And then I went in and I edited it. But we'll talk about that a little later. That's its own beast uh, to handle. So interface, reference image, and grids. And let me check to see if your questions. Ronnie's got a question. All right, and let's me while that's uh, getting prepped, let me uh, start looking at what we're going to be doing next. I'm going to go into File and Open and see if I can bring in what we worked on last week. Is this what we did last week? Uh, Ronnie, how do you crop the image reference? Uh, crop the image reference is most likely going to happen. Let's go into this guy under the adjust. See these little red lines? Okay, I'm just using these little red dots and moving it around. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, we were able to crop it. All right, Paul's got a question. What about the cross section with the grid system when left and right views cross? Left and right views cross. Not quite sure I understood that. Can you rephrase that, uh, Paul? And I will come to it. So let me, 
I, I don't want to see this image anymore. So I'm going to go into this texture here, and I'm just going to say texture off. I still have this whole draw mode thing, and I don't, I don't really want it. So I'm going to come to my fill mode, and I'm going to set it to zero. That gets me back to normal. And I don't want to see the, uh, the background, this grid in the background. So I'm going to just blow this button up. Let me redraw it really quick. You'll notice there are these little guys, X, Y, Z, right there in that floor button. This X, Y, and Z, they're so tiny. <laughs> they're like, I think they're like six pixels, five pixels, uh, something insane. Anyways, each one of those represents a view. So, for example, if we had X on right now, then we would be seeing a grid along this size, this side. But X is not on, only Y and Z, so we're seeing just Y and Z. So if you don't want a grid on, then you just turn it off so it's Y. I just click it. In this recording, as this is streaming from the internet, you are not going to see that button. You're not going to see what I clicked. You're going to think I just clicked the floor button. I did not. I clicked the little tiny Y there. You can get rid of Z. Oh, the space in this guy is kind of nuts. Y is up and down, and then Z is the background. That was a mental aberration. So choose what you want. Turn them off as you need. I'm going to turn them off entirely. Frank, uh, if you make the grid size smaller, will you turn it will you make the image smaller? All the way down, all the way up. So the grid is designed to fit that side, that, um, that unit, that whole square there. So the answer to that is yes. You can, of course, scale within, I think, or is that just, yeah, that's scaling within. You'll notice it's, it's scaling above the grid. Yeah, those little uh, ZYXs, I'm just looking at questions right now. The little ZYXs will definitely get you. Okay. All right. Paul, let me, how do you make something look, how do you make something to specific measurements in ZYX? This is a great question. Uh, Paul, I'm glad you asked, uh, but I'm going to say the key to specific measurements inside of ZBrush is exactly what Buddha said is the key to life, uh, and that's to not expect anything. <laughs> Just let what happens happen. In the beginning, when you're just figuring this stuff out, uh, don't let that question stop you. Because uh, I want to talk th about that later in terms of how you make something s with specific measurements, but that's going to introduce too many interface items right now. Uh, and I want to make sure you're comfortable with the systems and the general and the conception behind things. Uh, for those of you who know ZBrush, I might be talking about things that you already know, but hopefully we're talking about them at more depth than you'd had them talked about before. So save that question for later, and for right now, let life do what life does. Uh, how do you, Steve is asking, how do you rotate a tool along with all subtools to change the orientation if you accidentally build it backwards or facing Y, for instance? Uh, this is another question of how do you line things up. So how do you rotate a tool along with all subtools? Uh, Steve, I'll point this out, but we'll be covering this later for sure. You want to use what's called subtool master. 
Subtool Master will merge all subtools into one subtool, allow you to do some modification, and then send it back to all the separate subtools. So that's how you do that. And uh, someone mentioned in terms of image planes, is it easier to just, isn't it easier to just use Photoshop to scale the size? And uh, I'd agree. Uh, Roberta, thank you. Yes, it is easier, but that's if you know Photoshop. And I know that sounds like kind of a joke, but uh, there are plenty of sculptors that ZBrush is that first segue in. So uh, PixLogic had to keep that in mind, that um, sculptors tend to be Luddites, just love to use their hands and, you know, bang on surfaces. So, <laughs> so Photoshop might not even be in the toolbox. All right. 